Okay. Right, I'm going to start the stream. So we should be going live here. Now I see the CC button. Yeah, you, you probably have to reload. That's what I normally have to do um, for it to pop up. Yes, this is that that is what's going out right now. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Sherry. Um let me get up the other link from you. I see them. I, I saw a test test. This is a test one, two, three. November 2nd, 2018. Is the, you have the little red line under the CC button? Maybe if you reload again with it active. Uh, YouTube is being weird. Huh. Well, I mean, as long as you see it, that's what matters, I guess, yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Sorry, I have a phone call really quick. Sorry about that, Rob. Keychain, bracelet, necklace, wallet size card. Yeah, I mean, just YouTube's end, really, that 
I mean, it, it worked pretty well during testing, so. Yes, yes, we will have a handheld mic for them to use, uh, so you should hear them as well. We'll do our best. <laughs> do what we can, because, yeah, we always have that problem, too. <laughs> we'll, we'll do what we can with the short time that we have. Thank you. All right, I'm, all right, talk to you later.
Checking one, two. going to be past who will be walking around I, I i will do it if no one else does oh, okay so do we have one or two we have one for the walk around for uh... i'll take it with me in, in the back and then Check, 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 check. Yeah, Hello. Yeah. Hello. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, 
I'm Glenn Cummings, I'm president here at the University of Southern Maine. Welcome to our, our Chancellor's Town Hall, if you will. Um, we are pleased to have the Chancellor, Jim Page, with us today and also several members of his team. So thank you for being out here. This is an opportunity for us to talk about kind of the state of the university, but how does it fit into the larger constellation of the UMaine system, and it's a good chance for us to ask questions uh, and to hopefully get some some answers. Uh, you know, obviously uh, that we might need for how do we fit into the larger picture? What's happening? And how do we uh, we best operate within that constellation? So that's the purpose of today's meeting. Thank you for coming. I know many of you are super busy, so I really appreciate taking some time out for us to just have a, a good, I hope, healthy conversation today. Um, a couple things I think that uh, people know, but um, if you don't, I was I was handing out this, the USM Husky stuff with the Halloween candy at my front door. I think most of those 12-year-olds can't vote, but... Uh, <laughs> I just thought I would do it anyway. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we can't tell you, we have legal counsel here, we can't tell you uh, to uh, how to vote. We can encourage you to vote and to consider uh, question number four. It would be obviously very transformative for the humane system in particular for USM. So uh, with that also, if you are listening remotely and you have a question, uh, just usm.president at maine.edu. Again, that's usm.president at maine.edu. So when we get to the question and answer, if you are in Lewiston or if you are in Gorham, uh, please uh, just send us an email there. We'll add it to the list so we make sure that you get your questions answered as well. Uh, just I want to just give a couple just sort of sound bites about where USM is. We're actually in an amazing position. Uh, some of you heard uh, Nancy Griffin uh, last week. She uh, kindly took some time out from her busy day, put together a PowerPoint presentation about kind of where we are uh, enrollment-wise, and we compared ourselves to 2015 uh, to where we are in 2018. Uh, we are looking at a 5.1% growth. That is an enormous achievement. Um, it is worth just taking a moment and going, wow. <laughs> wow. Congratulations to everybody who made that happen. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. And this is, this is a student-by-student student set of actions. Uh, this means that people are looking at their students in their classroom, the staff members, advisors, are saying every student matters. Um, just a reminder that 52% of our students, their parents didn't go to college. And they are walking around here uh, with the same kind of feeling that I had because my parents didn't go to college, which is somebody's gonna tap me on the shoulder and tell me I don't belong here, right? They think that they're imposters. It's up to us to say, no, you're the real deal. You're the real deal. And somebody's doing that because we had a 6.2% increase in retention in just two year period. That is amazing. I can tell you there are colleges in this country, some of the most elite colleges in the country, that if they had a 1% increase in, in the retention, they would be celebrating. So to have a 6.2% means that somebody on a daily basis is making our students feel welcomed and comforted and also inspired to be here. So I can't thank you all enough, and I know many of you personally, and you are doing that. So the other thing I would just want to share with you is that, you know, there's so many amazing discussions about our kind of larger what we can become and how we can become. And that vision, that excitement is a little hard to put our fingers on, but there is everywhere people are saying, you know, we could even get better. And that is the most important thing. Because when I came here, to be honest, people were pretty down about where we were. And people didn't have that sense of where we can be. It's kind of like, oh my god, I can't believe we are who we are. <laughs> and I think now it's changed to, we could even be better. And that, I love that. Um, I do want to just briefly talk about our money. Our money is in a whole new place as well. Uh, we hit the 10 million dollar reserve mark. We want to be at about 13 million, so we've got work to do, but that is in its own right a big deal. What that means is if we do hit a, a, a tough bump a semester or two, we don't have to go into panic mode. It means we can't have three semesters of going into a bad spot, but it means that we are, we are actually doing some really uh, secure budgeting that gives us a little bit more oxygen as we go through our day and go through our semester. And that's a relief, of, as, you know, as in our home budgets. If we're, if we're making it paycheck to paycheck, it, it doesn't always feel comfortable. Uh, today, we have that little bit of savings that can really help us tremendously. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about today that we haven't talked about much um, 
is probably around the Graduate Center, since we have uh, you know Chancellor Page with us, kind of what's happening. And I wanted to make a special introduction today uh, for a woman who has already uh, made a, a great statement uh, in how she wants to operate with, with uh, certainly USM and all the other college presidents, and has been a terrific partner in the Graduate Center work that we're doing today. So we, as you know, as of July 1st, we, were, uh, we had a transition at the helm at the University of Maine up in Orono, and they have, uh, they have brought forward uh, Joan Farini Mundy, and she is with us today. So please join me in welcoming Joan. Uh, <laughs> Been a terrific partner. Uh, comes from the uh, the um, National Science Foundation, so has a lot of real deep understanding about kind of where. Uh, some of the grants are, which is very helpful, but also the process. And perhaps one of the great blessings of having Joan on board is that she really knows what is, have looked at a lot of applications in the National Science Foundation. She knows what really excellent pedagogy and excellent research looks like, and she can help us really guide to that next level of what that might look like. So we're delighted she's unfortunately had one bad thing against her is that she spent a lot of time in New Hampshire, but she's making up for that rapidly now, and uh, we, can, uh, we can certainly help her with that. So. So with that, I, I guess I would, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to, for the larger uh, sort of discussion from the whole humane perspective. Uh, one thing that, uh, that I encourage the Chancellor to talk about, which I want to thank him for, and, and let me actually, why I have the, the mic before I introduce the Chancellor, um, I just want to tell you that I spent almost a decade in the legislature, thought I really knew the legislature really well, and then in the last few hours, uh, we're up there with a $50 million bond, and some of our friends even were like, just take 35 and get out of here. And I was like, yeah, just take 35 and get out of here. And, and, uh, and Jim's like, no, you know, I'm going to go in. So we met with all of leadership, and he said, if you guys need to move us to 35 million instead of 50 million, uh, 49 million, uh, you can do that, but that's a political decision. But if you want my honest answer, we need $50 million to really do the work we need to do. I give him total credit, because that's not always easy, especially when your friends are starting to say, I just want to get out of here, and you guys are in the way. It's not easy to do that. He stuck with his guns. Uh, and an hour later, all leadership came out to him and said, it's 50. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty classy. That's a lot of strength there, and he did that for us. And I just want to say thank you again for, for that work. So thanks, Jim Page. Thank you. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming out. Obviously, we should have put the donuts down here. Uh, the, uh, it, and, and we ended up with 49. Uh, a longer story, a chapter in the book sometime. Uh, but uh, uh, we can't tell you. We can encourage you to get out, and all your friends, and all your friends' friends, because this is a, this is a, a question that is going to be, obviously, I mean, it's trivial. It's going to be determined by who shows up, but we know that there are people who, are, who understand and believe in the investment that needs to be made in our institutions and that this is the right time. And I don't think we have uh, organized opposition, people who are opposed to any of the universities or the work we do. But you know, in Maine, $200 million in the total bond packages is a lot of money. And, and Maine you know, are tough, frugal people, and they like to say no to something. So. Um, Get your friends, encourage them all to get out, encourage them to be educated around the issues and why these investments are what they are and how important they are, and we'll see how Tuesday goes. Uh, I, do want to, uh, I do want to thank everybody who has been putting a lot of work into the, to the groundwork to help us with the legislature to get that on the ballot. There was over a billion dollars in asks for bonds in this last go. 200 million was decided. And it's, you know, whatever work that Sam Warren, who's our legislative affairs person, who has tromped the halls of the legislature for more hours than, than you would want to imagine in the last year to get us where we are. Uh, Sam, I think people know who you are, but. Uh, there's so much we can do, but what really made the difference in terms of moving us to that part of the line was the incredible work that you've done here and your colleagues on the other campuses have done in the last five more plus years, the tough decisions that were made, the hard times that were gone through, the tough choices. But the fact that, that we were prepared to do that, we did it, and we did it in a way which, which 
in the end, uh, took all of the resources we could and moved them towards being student-centric, being moving it towards meeting the needs of the state in terms of workforce, in terms of research, in terms of these other areas, and moved the dollars out of the administrative function, moved them into the classroom where, to the greatest degree we could. That was the groundwork and the story behind that and how it happened, why it happened, and who it was in service to, the students and the people of the state. That's the work that you and your colleagues throughout the system have done, and that's what got us over. The rest of it was the, you know, making sure the story was understood, making sure the facts were there, and making sure that we needed to be, we were there when the decisions needed to be made. So that was a collective, a collective victory getting us on the ballot, and thank you all. It will be up to the people of the state in terms of, of how we fare on Tuesday. Uh, we will see. In any event, I was just talking with, with uh, Glenn and others. Uh, you know, we've, we've put just about everything out there for it. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a lot we could do, come in, uh, that uh, you know, we, we look back a month or, or two and say, I wish we'd done this different or that different. Um, but uh, people have just worked incredibly hard. And, uh, and if, if, effort, if effort is a signal of success, then I'm optimistic that we'll be successful. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about that and about uh, where we go from here. Obviously, if we are successful with the bond, a, uh, a significant amount of that money, 24, 25 million, I get lose, comes here. And it comes here, this is a opportunity because not only is it incredible amount of money in and of itself, but it leverages an enormous amount more. It signals to businesses, to the philanthropies, to others, that this is an institution that is positioned, that the people of the state have decided they want to invest in, that we can grow uh, the entire state, the economy and the well-being of the entire state by investing a large part of the resources, which are always scarce, in this institution and in this region. And so its, it's multiplier effect, if you will, is going to be very, very significant. And the, you, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the, the terrific plans that Glenn and his team have put together for developing the campus, for developing all the campuses, and serving, serving the entire region. Uh, it's, it, to some degree, it's a moving target because there's lots of opportunities. There's the, uh, there's the questions, and, the, and right now, the variability around those resources, but all of them, all of them are ones that speak to an important, a critical future for this institution in the future of the state of Maine, not just the greater Portland region, and that investment in this institution, investment in these students, investment in this community is ultimately not just one in, uh, an investment in Cumberland County, but it's an investment in the entire state. We are planning to go into the, we hope to go into the next session, the next legislative session, with an emphasis on getting our basic, what's called the ENG budget, uh, a, a, uh, uh, in, uh, our priority investment will be in that reach, in that area, to get that up to, we're looking to go for 3% uh, year over year, each year for the two years. Uh, about two and a half, two, two and a half percent is keeping up with the cost of, the cost of doing business, if you will, and especially in uh, uh, compensation and benefits, about 70% of our expenses are people. But there is money in there for, uh, for strategic investment as well. Not as much as we'd like, not as much as we could usefully deploy, but a reasonable amount given where we are and where we're going to go to move forward. It's very important then not just to have a successful vote on Tuesday in order to have the bond, which is important in and of itself, but also that we can go in and tell the legislature that the people of Maine have voted with their pocketbook, pocketbooks, if you will, and that we are worthy of investment, that we are worthy of backing. So that the payoff for a successful vote on Tuesday goes well beyond the dollars. It goes into the whole approach that we'll be in position to take with the legislature, with a new governor, with new legislative, a lot of new legislative leadership, and with uh, a, a whole new budget process coming up. So it's it's a it's a uh, 
we're, a, we're in a lot different place than we were three years ago, as Glenn said earlier. And I want to take a moment and repeat what he just said, but acknowledge and just use three, those three um, numbers or those three measurements that he alluded to. Uh, many, uh, looking across, many of you were here three, four, or five years ago. I recognize a lot of faces. And the idea that, we, that USM is now sitting on a $10 million reserve is phenomenal, right? Um, it is, it is, speaks to the, to, the, to the tough, hard work that's, that's gone on. If we look at the increase in enrollment of the 5% plus that's taken place in the last three years, that's against the backdrop Remember, where we are losing 2 and 3% statewide of high school graduating uh, numbers every year, every year. So to stay flat, you're still a couple of percentage points up. Now, that doesn't hit Cumberland and York as it does some of the other regions, but it's still a pool. So that's a significant number. But Glenn is absolutely right. A six-point Percentage, a six per point percentage increase in retention in the, in, the, in the two years that you've been really focused on this is, is nationally noteworthy, nationally noteworthy. Uh, whatever the secret sauce is, keep it going because it is going to be, it is, if that, if I could pick out one number and one parameter that would say what is going to really accelerate and drive success and opportunity in this institution, that's the number. You can't manufacture new bodies, but the ones you've got, if you can move them through and stop that awful trend, it's a, nation, a nationwide trend, but it's particularly hard here in Maine where people begin and then they stop out and too often when they stop out, they never come back. That stranded cost, not just in the dollars that those people have spent, which, which haven't yielded a degree, which haven't advantaged them, but more importantly, the psychological stranded cost of hopes, dreams, et cetera, that were not able to be fulfilled for whatever reason, making those individuals, getting them back into the educational pipeline, making them part of the state community and the state workforce, that's in a state of, as demographically challenged as we are, that's the future. So, uh, you know, I want, if, if you can keep this trend going, I want this place to be a laboratory, and I know you don't want to give away all your secrets, but uh, a laboratory for how we do this going forward for across, across the state. Um, let me talk a little bit then now about sort of next, next steps and uh, high level trends on that. First of all, uh, obviously, the bond and the investment that that would drive in here. But uh, there's three general areas that the trustees and uh, the presidents and I are focusing on. Uh, not, to, not to say other things are not being dealt with, but if we're going to give you three themes and three areas, uh, these would be the three. And they're not, not in any particular order. Uh, one is one I just spoke about, enrollment slash educational attainment. We have, as I think most of you know, we have a nationally enviable rate in high school graduation and a non-enviable rate in, in then people going on for post-secondary. Uh, we have to, we, Maine uh, as a state cannot afford to, to accept its current level of post-secondary attainment. Roughly right now it's about, if you count in uh, credentials of values, about 40, 41, 42% of adults in Maine have some kind of a post-secondary degree or a, a meaningful credential. Uh, the national target, which varies a little bit, state by state, region by region, is that a healthy economy in the future is going to require that to be 60% minimum. Maine has set a target of 60%. But if you took 100% of the young people now in the K-12 pipeline and got every one of them a two-year degree, a four-year degree, or a credential of value, you got 100%, you would close that gap from where we are now to the 60% by about half. There's just the numbers don't work. So that means two things. First of all, well, maybe three things. One, we have to continue to work with that group, and I'll come back to the early college piece on that in a moment. But the second piece is adults. The adult population has to be a focus of our efforts and our resources going forward. 
You know, six years ago, when I first came on, when I first took this job, almost seven years ago, uh, but who's counting? Um, the uh, I think there was only one campus that had uh, uh, student uh, advising services open in the evenings and weekends. That how are you going to serve these people if you do that? So one of the great transitions, and there's still room to go on this, but one of the great transitions is that now every campus has resources, people, offices dedicated to ensuring that we can reach adult populations and others, non-traditional populations, where they are, bring them in. And that's critical. The, the other piece, of course, building on that attainment and enrollment, is the state need for educated workers. I, again, a number that I think most of you are likely familiar with. The, right now, we have just over 700,000 people in the state of Maine in the core working age population of 25 to 64. I think the last number I saw was 710, but you know, give or take a couple. Right now, if we don't, if we're not successful in attracting significant numbers of new people to the state, and especially younger people, in the year 2030, that number is going to be 600,000. That's a 15% reduction in your workforce pool. No economy can be healthy with those numbers. So it's absolutely incumbent upon us, first of all, to attract more people into the state, to attract more people into the educational world, and in particular to ours, and to make sure that they are successful in their course of, of education, and to make sure that we are doing our absolute best to connect them to employment and career professional opportunities throughout the state. Again, USM has done some great, has done and is doing some great areas in that. But I think what you're going to see, both from, from Glenn and his work, from uh, President Freeney Bundy, and from all the presidents and from the trustees, is an increased emphasis on are we talking? Are, do we have the right connections? Do we have the right feedback loops? Are we getting the right engagements with our employer base so that our students have the very best opportunity to be successful here in Maine? That's the, you know, when, we, when we're up in Augusta and we're talking about the kinds of, of changes and things to, to meet these demographic and economic challenges, uh, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic bullet. But we have to be the university system because it's the, it's the largest net attractor of outside talent into the state of Maine. Often in terms of young people, untrained talent, that's fine, that's our job. But it's, if we're not doing it, there's nobody behind us. Who, I mean, obviously, there are companies who are doing it and individually on their basis and doing it very well. But there is no public institution except for us who can make that kind of difference and ultimately provide the kind of economic and social communities that the state is going to need uh, going forward, given these various challenges. So first emphasis on. Uh, and again, not in priority order, just as they occurred to me. First emphasis on enrollment attainment. Second is making sure that our, our, our students are well connected to opportunity, professional, career, life opportunities in the state. And then the third in, is to make sure that we are investing, because all of these changes that we're talking about, all these improvements, all these developments, are all investments, and investments takes resources and to make sure we are consciously using these resources to invest in programs and services and what you, whatever you may, which are going to optimize those outcomes and then also lift all boats, uh, we hope. That's the plan. So a very careful, uh, focused analysis and focused investments on those programs, on those services that are going to drive those outcomes to take the lead in driving those outcomes. So you'll hear more about that. If I was going to take a moment and just talk about a couple of particular instances of that, um, and they're ones which I, I'm frankly going to talk about because I know more about them than some of the others. Uh, one, of course, is the Maine Center, uh, which is this great collaborative effort between the University of Maine and the University of Southern Maine. 
I think I saw Terry Sutton, who's in the back, who just came in a little bit late. Uh, Terry is the CEO of, of Main Center Ventures, which is the entrepreneurial arm of this initiative. If you don't know Terry, I hope you will get to know her soon, and she should. John Henshaw, who's a COO from, from that operation, is, is here as well. And Joan and Glenn have really taken uh, a, a critical and important lead on, uh, on an initiative which, frankly, has had, it's had a long runway and some bumps going down that runway, but we're now, in, we're now in takeoff mode. And together with the provosts and the deans who are working this, and I, and I want a, a special shout out to the deans here at Bain, and there's Danielle is here and Joe Williams, and, and there's another one here I saw. Oh! <laughs> Michael Zamora, okay. Uh, uh, that, that are really doing the, you know, or the front line on this, who ultimately are going to be the people who, working together uh, with their counterparts from UMaine, will really, uh, will really move this, this thing forward. It is, it is important not just because it signals an opportunity for, that we can, we can get an advantage on other, other institutions uh, who are not going to be able to do this cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary approach who are, have the backing, the investment backing, to really be um, innovative. And you know, innovative is an easy word. Uh, hard to implement, hard to, to, to drive. But this is a group that is now coming together, can do this, that we are committed to providing the resources for making that happen. And it is what happens when you can get the, you know, the strengths of two, of two largest institutions uh, in the state from an educational perspective with complementary, overwhelmingly complementary strengths to work together and to drive this forward. So I think in the next year, we're gonna see enormous progress in this area, and it's going to be a differentiator for our students and, and for the state in, in a very short period of time. Uh, and we, we are even continuing to see, I think we're starting to see some architectural renderings of, of how that can fit in to, a, to Glenn's very ambitious campus plan, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we look at, we, we drive in here today and, and you can kind of imagine what this place is going to look like physically in 10 years. Uh, it's going to be an amazing, an amazing place with, with, with you know, a little bit of hard work and a little bit of luck to go with it. Uh, the early call, the other piece I was going to uh, note is that uh, the early college, which is a, a system-wide initiative, almost every campus is engaged with this. And this is one of those ideas that, that we were very fortunate in terms of our timing because the legislature sort of intuitively understood and took to the idea that, yeah, there's a lot of high school kids, our, our attainment levels are what they are. I've already talked about those. There are a lot of high school kids who are now, the world is opening up because of social media, oper ed different educational opportunities. And there's what they face, but what they also have is opportunities uh, really called out for early engagement with college level, um, uh, college level work, college level expectations, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw an enormous growth. There was always through AP and a couple of other courses, uh, a couple of other programs, Bridge and some others, there was always a few hundred students throughout the state uh, who were involved in that. And those, those were good programs. But we have gone from 700 students typically engaged in, in, in a given year to almost 3,000 now. Uh, and I think about 10% of those, roughly, are USM, are people who are involved in the USM program. And I expect that, given that the high school population here is, is larger than in many other parts of the state, I would expect that to grow. And people, and the legislature backed that. They gave us a special appropriation of $3 million to get that off the ground with a target, an informal target, to get up to 5,000 students, ultimately. 5,000 students, you know, if you're in New York City, is, is, is rounding error, right? There are 188,000, last time I checked, there were 188,000 high school seniors in New York City. There are 12,000 high school seniors in the state of Maine, right? So if we can get 5,000 of, of the junior and senior class, that's 20% of, of students who are being touched by these programs. 
who are learning. Uh, yes, some of them are ones who would be doing AP classes and others, they're, they're, they're the established group. But that's not 5,000 of them. That's not even the 3,000 we have now. The 3,000 includes students who are going to be economically advantaged because they're going to graduate with six, nine, 12 credits that they're not going to have to spend in, 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 in school. Equally, and perhaps even more importantly, there's a large number of those students who are ones who were not thinking that college was for them for one reason or another. Uh, and there's lots of those reasons. But we are hearing back from the, from the guidance counselors, we're hearing back from the teachers that all of a sudden they can see the light bulbs going off. I can do this work. I can, I can fit in here both academically and I can do it in that other sort of more intangible social sense that I, I belong doing work at that level. I don't know yet where it's too early. Is, is that really going to drive the needle heavily in terms of our uh, educational attainment? Uh, I hope so. Uh, time will tell. The early trend line suggests that it will, but it, it is early on yet. But we already know that for dozens and likely hundreds of students, this has made the difference uh, for them in how they foresee and think about their future. And given the challenges we have, that's valuable for every student, but given the challenges we have throughout the state of Maine right now that I've already hit on, that's, that's a game changer. So when I talk with our political uh, friends and, and uh, leadership uh, throughout the state, and especially up in Augusta, uh, and, and, and this is a group which is dealing with hard choices and hard facts. You know, they're not blind to any of the things that I've just talked about. But the biggest change and the biggest uh, bright light that I can see and I can offer them as we go forward is that the institutions of the public universities of the state of Maine have, have always had a commitment to the students and to the state. But we are showing through the actions that we've taken in the last several years that we are engaged, attentive partners, and we are prepared to do what is necessary to, do the, to, to provide the services that these students need and ultimately the state needs. And that's, again, the hard work that you and all of your colleagues have done. I thank you for that, and on that basis, um, I think that, that I have good hopes for Tuesday, but whatever happens Tuesday, we are, we are positioned as the state's best partner in addressing these issues, and we will grow on that, and uh, with that, all, you know, in, in, despite all of these daunting economic and demographic facts, uh, we should think of, of this institution and every one of our institutions as having a bright and critical future for the state. So that's my sermon uh, for the morning. Uh, I'm going to step back and take any questions you may have, uh, some of them. Uh, Bob Neely uh, is Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs is here. Ryan Lowe, Vice Chancellor for Finance Administration. Jim Thalen is General Counsel. I've already introduced Sam. I think that's everybody from my group who's here. And uh, I or we would be happy to engage in whatever you want to talk about. But I'll turn it back to Glenn for a moment, see if he wants to to punctuate or argue, puncture or punctuate, any of the points I just made. Uh, boss, those, that was brilliant. <laughs> um, I also wanted to introduce, um, some of you may know, Regan Thibodeau, who is our translator today. She's also a PhD student in our Muskie School of Public Policy, and I want to thank her and her teammate, Renee, for being here today. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you. I think it's I think it's yours. Uh, we I don't know if we have uh, stuff that's been sent in so far for emails, but uh, any questions people might have, and I'm sure there are a dozen topics that we we didn't get to. So if you have those, we'll be glad to try to answer them. And good morning. I do have a roaming mic. Uh, as President Cumming said, we have folks connecting to us remotely. So for the benefit of people joining us online, um, wait until the microphone is delivered. And I'll do my best Phil Donahue impersonation. Uh, Glenn, a uh, question for you. Um, yesterday you announced the uh, creation of the Maine North Atlantic Institute, and I was wondering if you could just speak to the intention behind that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, the Maine North Atlantic Institute is really a culmination of work that began about three years ago 
in earnest. I will give credit to the Maine Law School. I see some of the reps here today of the Maine Law School. Uh, many years ago, Maine Law was uh, one of the sort of major leaders in admiralty law or North, you know, ocean, ocean law and particularly North Atlantic focus. Uh, three years ago, we began to do a major structural a uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to being in the North Atlantic. Now, why the North Atlantic? Uh, quite frankly, um, there are a number of things that are happening. One is that we wanted to position Maine more in the middle as opposed to the end of the East Coast. And we realized there are huge markets and great opportunities in Iceland, in Norway, in the Canadian Maritime that gave our students a chance for internships, our scholars, our teachers, our faculty members chances for research, and it also gave us a chance for internships and workforce development in a very unique place. I give a lot of credit to Terry Shahada and Chris Sahanchak who really saw that vision, really attracted us. There's, other, there's another dimension to this that I think is really uh, both a little disturbing and intriguing in that for the first time, as you many, many of you know, our ancestors struggled for a long time to make it over the mythical, turned out to be ice cap across the top of Canada. Today, with ice barges, they can already do that. And within, they were expecting it to be about a half a generation where major trade routes would start going over the top of Canada. Sadly, it's probably about seven years away. Now that is a game changer. It's not. It's a little disturbing. It's very disturbing from an environmental point of view. But from an, an economic and transportational issues, it is actually literally a world game changer. It is actually faster to go from Eastport, Maine to Shanghai than Eastport, Maine through the Panama Canal to Shanghai. And it's much more expensive to go through a canal system in which Panama charges you a lot of money. This could mean that Maine, if you look out within a decade, could be the first major port of entry as you come into the United States. So a good university, and I mean a good university as in the whole humane system, because thank you, um, you know, uh, Dr. Farini Mundi has already said she would love to talk to us about her excellent world-class, world-recognized climate institute being a part of that. And since we don't play in that field, that's a great honor for us to have that partnership. <laughs> UNE also has a very strong marine biology program, as does UMaine. They're willing to play as well. So we consider this an inclusive, not an exclusive partnership, but we know we've been doing all kinds of things in tourism, hospitality, in the health field, and in uh, business and entrepreneurship, a bunch of other places as well. Our honor students have been going regularly to Iceland. Uh, these are unique opportunities for our students, and it positions us to be ready for the future. A good university is looking around the next corner. It's looking around the next bend, uh, and for good or for bad, I think you know there are some good good pieces of this is that we will see much more transport over the top of Canada. We need to be ready for that. We want to be in a position not for them to travel past Portland and go to Boston or New York. We want them to come here and be a part of it. We want our students to have workforce development opportunities to the south of us and to the north of us and to the east of us. So we are developing all kinds of partnerships. I will also just add, it seems like a niche, but, uh, but it actually uh, is already starting to germinate here in Maine. We are having two major recirculatory uh, aquacultural fish breeding farms that are coming into places that were like Bucksport and Belfast that we have not seen before at this capacity. Why is that important to our North Atlantic strategy? Because the Norwegians, and to some extent the Icelandics, but mostly the Norwegians, have shown an enormous world leadership in aquaculture. And the Scottish at the University of Aberdeen have a certificate in this recirculatory aquaculture. So having those partnerships directly now is helping, as an example, directly helping these two main industries potentially get off the ground. So, so that's the, the logic behind it. Uh, we, we're excited about it. I also will say on a very pragmatic note, it's a pretty, we've tried to get as many of our honor students to have an international experience. We've been underwriting that through philanthropy and we've underwriting that through MEIF and, and um, supporting that as best we can within the budget. And to get to Reykjavik from Boston is actually a fairly cheap flight. And if we have partnerships with Reykjavik University and University of Iceland, then our students are getting international experiences. And remember, many of our students can't afford to have international experiences the way uh, maybe a more of a private uh, elite college might. So for us, to get them to, to Reykjavik, get them out of Maine and get them to see the world a bit without costing us you know, tens of thousands of dollars per student is a big help for us. So 
those are, uh, sorry if that's a long-winded answer, but we're excited about why we're doing that. We think it has a lot of implications going forward over the next uh, decade. If I can uh, just add quick to that, I just want to reinforce a point that, that Glenn made, well, two points perhaps. One is that uh, this is one of the payoffs of having a law school as part of your uh, organization because business law, international law, marine law, all of those areas are the early drivers because if you don't have those items settled out and understood as part of your business environment, it's very difficult to go anywhere on that. So uh, I think that, that Glenn already pointed that out, but I want to reinforce that point. And I'm looking back to the back corner with Danielle and colleagues, and, and thank you for taking leadership on that. Second point, which is off topic uh, for that a little bit, is I realized that I did not point out uh, Chip Gavin, who's head of strategic procurement for the system, who's here as well. So my apologies. And, If you'd like to send an email uh, in for a question, it is at usm.president at maine.edu. usm.president at maine.edu. Uh, Ed Suslick's about to speak. He's going to complain that it's not Tony Donuts and t instead of Holy Donuts today. You took the question right out of my lips. Uh, to the chancellor, as a public institution, and knowing that there's a statewide debate, a local debate swirling in the state right now around proficiency learning, statewide learning results, um, having served in the legislature with the president, knowing that too often public policy is, is made on anecdote as opposed to data, uh, do you, and knowing that the UMaine system is probably the single largest destination for Maine's high school graduates, thereby a treasure trove of data, we probably have students enrolled from every school district in, in Maine, are you satisfied we're doing enough to put that data to work, synthesize it, study it, and then make recommendations to the statewide policymakers on what we should be doing around K through 12 education? I'll start, thank you, I'll start that, but I'm in part stalling for time for, to give uh, Bob Neely an opportunity to collect his thoughts and respond to this as well, because he's the data expert on educational items here. Uh, the answer is we are doing better than we have in the past and that we have a long ways to go. And the reason for that is there's not been, there's, uh, 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 there's two things. One, there's not been an adequate infrastructure for effective sharing of data. And two, there has not been, I'll say, an adequate, a sufficient culture of sharing that data and looking for the larger roll up and then converting that data into useful information at the policy level at the state. Um, so we are making the, both the state, most, no, excuse me, the state, many of the school districts and our institutions are doing a lot better work in gathering that, a lot better work in converting that data information. There is great, I will put it this way, there is great opportunity still in how we will do that. I think the, the, uh, the and I'll, my personal view on the, uh, on the recent back and forth on proficiency is that there are, I've, I've heard lots of arguments on both sides and I am not a, an expert in pedagogy and, 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 and public school uh, pedagogy at all. Uh, but what strikes me as the lost opportunity is, you know, a, a decade spent in that discussion and for the most part, institutions, uh, the, the local school districts, et cetera, are still back 10 years later wondering, okay, what's the best way forward for me now at this point? And that's, you know, we can't continue to con go in that direction. The data we are getting is very, very useful and important. Uh, Bob will, I'm stealing, I'm, I'm, he, now I'm channeling him. Uh, he will tell you that there are opportunities out there from a technical perspective, from a, a technological perspective, to individualize uh, student data. Uh, he worked at an institution where every incoming student, they already had a, a success profile. And they knew the percentages and where the weaknesses, given the background, given the academic background and other areas, what the likely weaknesses and strengths of that student were going to be. And so you could particularize uh, a service core for them. That's the level we've got to get to given some of the other, but we're a long, long ways from that. But Bob, would you like to? You gotta use the, you gotta use the mic, oh, sir. 
there, there's not a, a great answer to this. Um, we can answer the question. Definitely got to go. Um, one of our largest investments out of my office in the last two years close to seven hundred thousand dollars in building up our capability. kind of predicted capability that we have in our office. Part of it is that we don't have enough software. Seven um, different ways. So we've set up a, in the last year, uh, a whole hierarchy related to governance structure. And some of the people in this room are involved in that with the data advisory committee and a data of that. Um, we're trying to get to the point where we can put together um, an IRS not just for the legislature, but really for everybody, for you, in fact. Um, but we're getting there. Jim talked about early college a while ago, and we're building a whole IR agenda around early college to make a case for what percentage of the students on to the, the U main um, but but we're trying to build that case. Now the other part of this though is in addition to, to building our IR capability, uh, we are engaged with the Department of Education in discussions trying to couple what data they have with the data. Is that better? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, trying to work with the DOE to work out some data pieces there to begin to produce a longitudinal data set um, from uh, public education all the way up through higher education. That's a little tougher because there are um, issues related to uh, student numbers and social security numbers and things like that, but we are engaged in those conversations. So the answer is we're trying to get there. We're trying to get up to where a lot of universities are at this point in time. But I, th I think we have a long, long way to go. Now, capabilities do differ broadly across campuses. The best IR uh, approach we have is, of course, at UMaine at this point. Uh, but after that, we basically have one to one and a half people on each campus the kind of data we need to make these compelling cases. <laughs> is this working yeah there we go okay uh I'm a you would think uh <laughs> Testing. I'm going to hold it gingerly. Um, as I was saying, I'm a contract faculty member at the law school, and it's nice to hear you say nice things about the law school, but in this beginning of the conversation, we're talking in the tens and millions of dollars about the reserve at USM and the bond question. And we're all here from the law school operating on a shoestring budget. <laughs> Is that better? What? what? Anyway. Well, this is destroying the effectiveness of the question. Let's try, try that, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the, the larger point that I'm trying to make is I would like to hear what your vision is for the law school for the next two, three, five years, because from where I'm sitting, the law school is in need of support from the larger university at a level that uh, you know our peer institutions, frankly, are getting, and we're just not seeing it. And we have multiple non-tenure track contract faculty members teaching core courses in the first year in a graduate program that 
is a flagship for the state, frankly, and it's it's in need of, of support, and we're not getting it at the levels that it should be getting. And I think that if you're going to continue to tout the law school as a you know a pioneer, as a leader, as among in the institution and in the state, then we need to have a vision for what that leadership looks like in the next three, five, ten years. Otherwise, uh, you know, I feel like we're just leading ourselves into the abyss. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just jump in because I think your response will be the same to both of us, and I just wanted to add my two cents before you, you go ahead and uh, give us your thoughts. Uh, so my name is Richard Chen. I'm a professor, associate professor uh, at the law school. I've been there for about three years. Um, and I think uh, as uh, Professor Moffa's uh, comments suggest, and he has to go to class, I think, so he's not, he's not walking out on my question. Um, but, yes. Um, so, you know, morale at law school is low, and if I can give you this perspective, when I got here three years ago, I knew that the, there were challenges because of the national environment, there were enrollments were down, and um, I was still very excited to come because we had a really great community of faculty, staff, and students, and I knew that we uh, were going to work very hard to build something great. Um, but, you know, we all put in short-term sacrifices and worked hard with the idea that we were going to prove our value to the system um, and that that in turn would lead to a better partnership and more investment um, so that we could actually deliver on our potential. Uh, and so what happened is, you know, we, we came back at the beginning of this academic year and we heard that, you know, um, maybe no, no, uh, a lot of uncertainty about what uh, increased appropriation, if any, we were going to get and that there were even further discussions of, of uh, more cuts, right? And so that's what I mean by uh, uh, serious um, demoralization because we felt like we were trying to build something So we have these uh, these really great things that are uh, ongoing, and if uh, with the appropriate investment, we could really uh, become a tremendous resource for the state. We could become a national uh, leader uh, and ha really have that respect throughout the country. Uh, but I, what I really want to emphasize is that there's a real downside risk that we're looking at as well, and that is, um, you know, the lack of support and the demoralization that I'm just describing. It is causing a lot of us at the faculty to wonder whether we and, and staff to wonder whether we can. Uh, stay at this institution uh, and whether we can believe in its future. Um, and, and by that I mean, you know, are we actually delivering on the promise that we are making to our students when we have contract faculty teaching them in the first year and afford to hire full-time permanent faculty, right? Two out of the three, I'm teaching in the first year, two out of the three of us are not, uh, do not have permanent status. What kind of message does that send to our students, right? And, and so what I, w I hope that you'll think about is that if people decide uh, to move on, uh, given the current lack of, of investment and support, you know, it's a tiny school, and we're talking about two, three, four people, those types of departures are gonna send a really troubling message to our current students, and think about incoming students considering whether to attend and whether they're going to uh, be willing to come to a school that is showing those signs of distress, right? And so that is gonna create what uh, I think you can understand would be a downward spiral, right? The next class is gonna be harder to fill. The class after that is gonna have uh, lower credentials, rankings are gonna drop, and we're gonna have um, an even harder time tr uh, filling this class, right? And so this is what, you know, a real uh, a concern that I, I hope that you'll take seriously over these next couple weeks. Um, and I, I understand that one possible answer to this is, you know, we have the center, and the center has a lot of promise, and that could actually solve a lot of the issues that we were describing. But what I do wanna uh, emphasize to you is that there's a lot of uncertainty about that and there might not be time because uh, by the time that everything at the center is up and running, we might not have much of a law school left to, to partner with. Well, I think I heard in those, well, my response to those two questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bifurcate slightly and uh, somewhat artificially because they can't really be, but I'm gonna start there. And also, ultimately, uh, ask Glenn to chip in, to step in here as well because it's his, his responsibility. There are two, what I heard were concerns centered on two areas. One, 
mission and ability to fulfill that mission and the future vision for that. And second is the resources needed to make the first happen. Obviously, they are connected. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But let me start with, start with a, a little bit of a differentiation there. In terms of the traditional mission of the law school, it's something, it, it, and it's, as you, I think you all know, it's the only law school in the state. It is, if you look at its alumni base, the great majority of, of attorneys, of jurists, of many business leaders come, are alumni of that institution. And for that reason alone, and the resources that it puts in, feeds into the state, uh, the, law school, the law school is a critical statewide resource. In terms of how the, the law school evolves and fits into the future, again, this is not an area of, of, of my expertise at all, but there's certainly some, some things that are pretty clear. One is that as the law profession and what's required of the law education and uh, ongoing professional development basis changes, and my attorney friends ensure me that it is, it is changing, um, then how best does a small, but therefore possibly nimble institution react and, and move that forward. And I think that in the programs that Dean Conway has, has put forward, you alluded to some of them, in the main center opportunity, uh, you see how some of those begin to get developed and move forward. So I'm not saying that those are the, the, the silver bullet answer to these questions, but you, there are at least pathways, there are ways to move which address those challenges. If we move over to the resource side, one of the things that we do do is look very carefully at what's happening at other institutions, peer institute, law school institutions, um, especially public ones, uh, throughout the country, but especially regionally. And the challenges that, that Maine law has are not unique. They're exacerbated by the relatively small size, but Applications are what they are across, et cetera, et cetera. The underwriting by the governing institutions um, are what they are, and my counterparts, I have many discussions with my counterparts in other, in other states and other parts of the country of how do you maintain in this, in this environment, how do you maintain a robust program in, in law and related disciplines? And again, going back that the ideas that the dean has put forward, the main center, and by the way, the, the law school has been you know, right there with the main center uh, since its inception. So, uh, but that does not address, that's the, how do we move forward? And I look to you and your colleagues and the deans and leadership to, do, to play out the details of how that will go. But if we look at the immediate short-term range, uh, first of all, I want to dispel one quick point. Um, you know, Glenn, we both, Glenn and I, have made a, uh, a noted that it's a $10 million reserve. I've not heard it here, but I've heard it in other, in, in other places during my time that, hey, we've got X millions of dollars. Let's spend it. And there is a great temptation to invest and use that for those things. But this institution, more than any other institution in the state, should know the value of having that reserve as a buffer for the very reasons that Glenn has pointed out. So what the exact number is there, whether it's 10 million, 13 million, 5 million, whatever it is, there is a number there that you want to be at for the well-being of the institution and you want to, re you want to uh, resist, resist and resist and resist the temptation to dip into that uh, because there's going to come a day, there always is, where the, 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 the viability of a program or an institution will depend upon the ability of, to, to access those funds. We have been in active discussion for a, a while now with the law school about how to resource short term and longer term. And there are some very active discussions going on right now involving the dean, involving Glenn and his staff, involving Ryan Lowe and his staff. I don't want to any of them can speak to, to the current status of that. I will say that it is a topic which has my attention, which has the board's attention. Um, and so we are looking for leadership, your leadership my, uh, and people from my team to come to a, a, a good solution to that that is feasible and sustainable. Uh, and if they're in a position where they want to speak to some details, that's fine. 
I'm not going to at this point, but I will say that we are watching and we are very engaged in this in the very questions you raised. Glenn, is it or is this on? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, first of all, let's let's just start with this incredible vision. I'd love to be the main law school right now. I got a donor who says I want to give fifty to a hundred million dollars to the main law school. I got to see some things first, but I want to do that. I want you guys to have an exciting connection to business and to Muskie, uh, our public policy school. And so our donors is, are excited about that, and they're helping us. And I got to tell you, Dean Conway, uh, Faruza Pavri, Joe Williams, uh, in the MBA program and our business program have been outstanding. They're starting to work together. So you're, you've got a commitment that's now in excess of $10 million already spent in starting to develop this concept. They're also promising to rip down the eighth ugliest building in America, or at least in higher education, and build a brand new building. So I would love to be the main law school because nobody's talking right now to the School of Social Work about would you like 50 to 100 million dollars, right? So that's a pretty exciting, exciting place to be. Nobody's talking to our linguist, linguistic school, wouldn't you like to get 50 to 100 million dollars? So the answer to your question, you got a good future. And here's the problem, you got a river to cross. You got to talk like adults. I can't give you, I can't get you off contract labor for probably two or three years, right? I can't. For years, the law school basically made a very bad deal. They basically said, I don't really want to be part of USM, so why don't you just give me a set amount of money for about $800,000? Let's do a handshake. We'll, we'll take it from there. Unfortunately for them, that was a bad deal because what they didn't see is a major recession that gutted out interest in law schools. Now to fill those seats, what they've had to do, which is perfectly appropriate, is discount really heavily to fill those seats. Totally don't blame them. They're doing exactly what we all have to do. We got competitive, did the same thing. So as a result, they're not paying their bills, meaning there's about an eight, $900,000 gap every year. This won't surprise you. I don't have $900,000 to give to them. So we have to have now a partnership. Now, what I have said is, I agree with you, you're underappropriated. You're underappropriated. You're at $800,000. It probably should be closer to a million and a half, two million. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a 50% increase in your appropriations. I'm going to give you 425000 now, if I went to Nancy Griffin today and said, I'll give you 425000 she's a happy woman. And if I went to Joe Williams and said, I'm going to give you an extra 425000 for your program, she's a happy woman. And Adam Tachinsky and Jerem Qualls will all say that. But they're not getting it. The law school's getting it. So you can see this cup as, I wish I were getting a lot of money. Or you can say, thank you. Thank you for helping us get across that river. Now, I'm going to have to do some, some tough questions, and that's why we've got a, a committee that's working on, are you spending every money, every cent you have in the most efficient way? That's a fair question when you're 900000 in the gap. So we've got three or four people that are looking at it very seriously, and we're saying, hey, are there things we could do on the back end with, between USM and the law school that could be productive, that could be helpful? that could you basically save you a few hundred thousand dollars. Now we're starting to get to a bridge. It's a thin bridge, and it's a frail bridge, but it's all we got to get across that river, right? So that gets us to a place where the law school, which is extremely important, but it's number one among equals, right? I like my social work program. I like my musky school, and I like my, my graduate schools in a whole bunch of other places just as much. But when you look at where they are, we've got a path to get them through a difficult time, and then we've got some promised land that a lot of us don't have. We got some promised land that says we have to build graduate and law school housing on this campus to make it easier and cheaper for law students. We got the potential for endowments for the law school, never had before, from the, from the Alphon Foundation. 
And we've got the promise of a first class, unbelievable school, physical building that will be outstanding. And if I have anything to do with it, it will definitely be built right here on this campus. So I'm with you. I see the problem. I work with Dean Conway on a regular basis. But we've got to take some honest, solid look at where we are and what we can do for the next few years as we get to that place. And I can tell you this. If we come to the Alphon Foundation and we say, oh, by the way, we're blowing a $900,000 budget every year with the law school, I can tell you there are members of that board who will say, why are we giving them any money? I'm out of here. So I'm going to ask the law school to work with me, find a way to find a good, solid solution to this problem, which I think I've given. I am generously giving $425,000, which around here is a lot of money. And then I'm asking them to come in at a quarter million, $300,000 of some back-end consolidation. This is what it means to, to be adults. We've got to do this. And then at the same time, the chancellor is saying, look, I might help you out if you show me honest and true hard decision making. So not the answer you want, but I can tell you you are in the best position for a future of almost any other department. The only thing, uh, just to, uh, to uh, qualify a little carefully, uh, Glenn's use of the word promise there is metaphorical, not literal, as of yet. Um, Jim, I wanted to ask a, a question on behalf of some of our faculty. Um, you know that we've worked really hard to say yes to academic partnerships. Mm -hmm. So I want to just say thank you to the faculty from nursing and education who decided to go out and, and kind of be the pioneers um, for us in, in making the academic partnerships program work. I've had a really good question from those faculty members that I'm going to ask on their behalf today. Sure, it's probably here. a question to Bob, not me, but which, oh. whichever. <laughs> no, I think it's a question to you. Oh, okay. <clears throat> because it's about, it's, it, and it relates to something you said about needing to bring students from elsewhere into Maine because our student population in that workforce age is in decline generally. So. A really good question I've had, especially from the nursing faculty, is, wait a minute, Janine, you're telling us we should be going out and taking our programs online and marketing them all over the country. We came here to teach Maine students and to help Maine's nursing, and Maine is where the nursing shortage is. So I think there's, there's a tension between serving Maine and going out with AP and, and recruiting in Connecticut. So I just, I wanted to give you the opportunity from the very top of this whole UMA, UMAIN system to, to speak to that tension and how you see it. Because I think they need to hear from you. They've heard me. I'm doing the best I can, but I'm not, you know, I'm not you. And so it's important they hear from you. All right. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I'll still give Bob an opportunity to, 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 to either, as I say, puncture or punctuate at the end. Uh, for, if any of the faculty, the Janine, are, are literally here, I, whoever you are, thank you for for stepping up and all right, uh, uh, I don't see attention now. I grant you that there are there are. Wait a minute, where am I supposed to be focusing? But I actually don't see attention. Although I can see how one would see it, and here's why not. There are two needs here that are, that this 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 program uh, in theory will will address or address in part. One is. We have a need for, you've, especially if you're in the nursing program or if you've been paying any attention to the press recently, the, the, uh, the healthcare systems, the nursing association and stuff have been very articulate and very precise in, in uh, and I'm going to use a, a nursing as the example here, um, in articulating the shortage, right? Right now, there's, it's about 600 openings in the state. And that's going to grow. It was going to grow to 3,200 by 2025 because of the changes in the investments that we're looking to make in the programs. We think we can reduce that now to about 2,700. That's still a huge number. So one of the challenges and one of the opportunities is how do we uh, open up more capacity for Maine students? And because there's not enough Maine students at the end of the day, how do we bring more people in? First objection, wait a minute, I'm in Connecticut, I want these pieces, but I'm not going to move to Maine, I'm going to stay in Connecticut. Well, the upside to that 
is that if we see the kind of numbers that uh, our pro formas are, are anticipating, we're going to be able to scale the nursing program here and the other nursing programs as well up considerably. It's the, that outside group which will fund the growth of capacity further for those in the state. So in theory, it becomes mutually reinforcing. Now, proof will be in the pudding. Uh, but the, the, the opportunity, we do not have the resources to go out and find, and I'm just going to make up a number here, 500 nursing students from away who will be, would be participating in an AP type program. But if we have those 500, and frankly we hope it's going to be more, then not only do we have are we going to serve more, ultimately serve more people who are going to be directly involved in Maine, but we're going to be able to scale the program to include more people from Maine and with better resources and better training. Bob, what would you want to add to, to that? Well, I'm, I'm in the same place Jim is. Um, I don't think any of us have ever assumed that other states in lieu of Fact, what we're trying to do is raise the whole system by the bootstraps. This is about a couple of things. One, enrollment and revenue, trying to increase the revenue into the system. I've talked to a lot of people that are using an online management provider at other, at other systems and other schools, and they have revenue sharing programs where some of the money is going back to the units. There's no reason if we see the kind of growth, especially in nursing, that AP thinks we'll see, that um, the nursing units can't start investing themselves, and they can, at their discretion, direct that money where they, they, where they want. But, but the other piece of this, so there's the revenue enrollment piece, but it's just the profile of Maine. Um, we're really not on the map in any kind of, of national context. You look at Arizona State, you look at Purdue, you look at Wisconsin, they are. If we want to start attracting people to this state, we've got to raise the profile of our educational enterprise, too. That people start thinking, this is the place to come if you want to be a nurse. I mean, the opportunities are here everywhere. So, you know, we've, we've got to think bigger than just Maine. I, I, I used these numbers the other day in the ASA meeting with the board. There are... Um, 44 million adults in the United States that only have a high school diploma. There's another 35 million adults that have some college but no degree. We've got to start playing in that space, and we can't do it just in Maine. We don't have the population. So, you know, I wish we had the resources where we didn't have to partner with academic partnerships or any other online management provider and share revenue, but the truth of the matter is we don't. What we'd like to see is some years from now, we've raised our profile that we can go it alone, like an Arizona state has, and really be big players in, in this space. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to encourage people to think a little bigger than they have in the past. Got time for one or two more? Anybody, anything from the other locations? I'm not sure. Hi, so you don't have to get too specific about this answer, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the outlook of the humane system after the gubernatorial election. Could you be a little? <laughs> well, well there's, there's a couple of things that jump out. One, we'll have a new governor. Uh, and with new governor comes a whole new environment. And this is the case after every gubernatorial election where you have a transfer of power. So there will be a whole new environment. And uh, you know, the governor in the state of Maine is a very, very powerful uh, position and sets the tone for much of what happens throughout Augusta. So uh, it will be important. You know, we've met with all of the candidates, all four of them. Uh, we have made, uh, made sure that they are, uh, have as much information as, as they could, frankly, more than they would want at this stage of the game. 
but we wanted to make sure that uh, they were, we, we had had our, our opportunity to explain to them what we see as the role of the University of Maine system in the future of the state. And I will say that all four of them, although they have different programs and they have different approaches, I guess there's three now, uh, all four of them acknowledged uh, the, the critical role that we play. How that will play out in policy, they're being, you know, people are being a little, uh, a little careful about that until they know where they are and, 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 and what they're going to do. Um, I will say that the other piece, however, is that, you know, say what you will, you, we, one could have a good public policy debate about the value of term limits, but one of the effects of term limits is you've got a roughly, uh, you know, 20 to sometimes as much as 40% turnover in the legislature after an election. 40 is rare, but it's happened when there's been a wave of one side versus another. But you got 20 almost guaranteed. And with that, uh, you have a you have an educational process which is con you're continually starting over. You know, what do we do? Why are we important? Why are we in, the, in this great uh, competition for resources? Why should we take a lead, have a lead role in that? So uh, the, uh, the leadership, uh, both the, the Republican House and Senate leadership have termed out. So uh, there will be new leadership on that side. We don't know where the, the, the Senate probably is going to go. Uh, as a result of those decisions, the people who make up the Education Committee, I, we have some sense of continuity there, but we also know there's going to be a major turnover. So there is a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is you've got a, a significant number of new players. You have to, you have to make sure that they are, they, uh, are properly briefed on, on who we are and what we're going to do, repeating myself. And then the second is we have to continually work with them to ensure that we're a priority. And that's the challenge. The challenge isn't, you know, higher educa or education generally, you won't find very many people in Augusta who, are, who don't think education is valuable. What you will find is it's valuable, but it's number five on my priority list when only the top two or three ever get really worked. The challenge is always to get the case made for being in that number one, two, or three position. And Glenn and Ed and others perhaps here who have had the uh, legislative uh, experience at Augusta on the other side of the fence can speak it with more, uh, more authority and more detail there. But it's going to be, you can, look at the, you can look at the turnover in one of two ways, as the challenge that I just articulated and the opportunity, because you've got a whole set of people who are coming to the issues fresh uh, and open to, generally speaking, open to the data, the arguments, and the good sense, and the opportunities to prioritize all our parts of education going forward. So I know I'm not being very specific, and you invited me not to be, thank you. Uh, but it is, it'll be a whole new, it'll, it'll, it'll be in a very real sense a whole new ball game. But it always is, at least every eight years, if not every four. Lynn or Ed, do you want to add anything to, Lynn? No, I just want to say, have good, strong connections to the humane. You know, certainly, uh, you know, Janet Mills is a graduate of our law school. Uh, we have Sean Moody, who has been a, uh, you know, on the board of trustees here, the uh, pain system as well as the community college. So, I think either way, that there's certainly going to be, I think, healthy discussions. And we saw what came out in the bond package last year is a number of people emerged as leaders for us uh, around the bond package, and many of them are returning. So, you know, I think it's overall. Uh, I think I don't know how Sam feels about it, but I think overall we stand a good chance of being able to, to at least, as uh, the chancellor said, make a strong case for why we we need what we need. Just keep in mind that we haven't gotten CPI appropriations, you know, consumer price index or inflation-based. Uh, you know, appropriations in quite a while. And that's part of the struggle, I think, of the humane system. So whoever it is, I'm, I'm hoping we can get them to come in with an appropriations that at least matches inflation and, and ideally above. And that would be a, a good place for us to start. So uh, I think it's a reasonable ask. I think we've started to deliver some things in a much more efficient way. And, and we have a vision around workforce development that I think will be really attractive to the legislature and the next governor. So I think we're in a good position to have healthy discussions, never easy and never quite predictable in the legislature, but I think we're, we're in a good place.
I do want to say that, you know, that, that, that if you look at especially comparatively, relatively speaking, the, 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 the governor and the legislature in the last four years especially have, have done well by us uh, in terms of the money that have come through and their support uh, back and forth. So, and especially, uh, you know, I was looking at the, uh, we get about 35% of our revenue from the e g budget from the state. Uh, New Hampshire uh, declared a major, major victory when they went from six to nine percent of their funding coming from the state. So it gives you a, 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 some sense of the that the, the Maine's not ever been wealthy enough to just you know throw money at, at, at problems and at us. But in terms of maintaining a bipartisan support for the core elements of education, uh, we're very fortunate there from from both parties. We're at the scheduled time. Do we have one? I was going on that. I'm happy to, happy to. Okay. You got to wait for the mic. Okay. Thanks. So um, I came in a couple minutes late, so I'm sorry if you already addressed this, but I'm wondering about your thoughts about um, the prospect of a name change for USM um, to something like UMaine Portland. Um, I know that President Cummings has been um, really focused on making sure that um, we have metrics and information from alums and from out-of-state students, or prospective students, um, but I'm interested in, in your perspective on that possibility. Well, Glenn and I were just speaking about that on the, on the walk over here, uh, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, the, the, the latest and greatest should come from him, not me. But in response to your question, I think it's, I think it's, it's an intriguing idea, and I'm going to be a little weaselly here because I don't have a settled position. Uh, I think it sh if it's going to happen, it should be driven by real outcomes and nothing cosmetic. And Glenn is, I think we're in full agreement about that, that as the result of if there is a name change, it improves the situation, either with respect to marketing or enrollment or whatever brand, whatever the case may be. And that's going to be backed up by real data. And so that ultimately the trustees who would make the decision on this would, would be in a position to say that's worth, because if you're going to make the change in, in it, for any institution like this, first of all, you're going to tick off half your alumni, right? Just guaranteed. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, it's, it's, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in signage, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in signage. It, it, it results in market confusion for a period of time. So you've, you've got to have a case for the outcome on that that is greater than those costs. Uh, given that, uh, Glenn made a commitment when he and I first started talking about this that he is going to make this a data-driven, information-driven uh, initiative. And he's been working that. And uh, I think it would be a little premature of me to say anything about that. But I think we're moving closely to where Glenn would be able to. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And uh, since it was asked by the alumni director, um, I don't have good news on the data for you. Um, this is exactly what uh, we were expecting. I think uh, many of you know I've been saying this for a while. Uh, the two college presidents that I talked to who went through name changes said, expect two-thirds of your alumni to not want to change the name. Uh, this is pretty normal human behavior, right? I, I own, you know, mom and dad, I don't want to move to Ontario with you, right? I mean, they, they like what they like, and it makes sense. That's exactly what happened in the data just came in a couple of days ago. About 63, 64% of alumni said, please don't change the name. I will tell you, though, one of the great reasons why uh, there are... Um, there was opposition is, you're doing great, don't blow it, was the number one counter argument, which is actually really a great counter argument. Um, I don't think you're going to get over that. Whenever you have a name change, that's what happens. It usually takes about two years for most people to say, that was a really good idea. I have more positive news. Uh, first of all, that usually it's two-thirds internally that don't want to change the name. We're at about 52, 53% opposition, meaning about we're about 50-50 split internally. There are lots of people who understood that, whoops, I think we're sometimes confused for a community college where we look very regional. This is not the statewide school, and we have a huge asset in Portland. So, so the internals um, those are the those are the negative. You know, I would say the negative, but not as negative as you would expect. And even the alumni are saying really good reason. On the very positive side, 
the ratings for wanting to highlight Portland both in state, and by the way, surprise in the data, the name Portland was more highly prized inside the state than it was, it was prized by both, but it was even more pri highly prized in state, this, inside the state as being a place where cultural activities, very high vibrancy, great place to do internships, businesses, prosperity, a sense of life and vitality was marked extremely high even from people, uh, students that were, were surveyed, pre-students and parents, et cetera, in the state. And equal, uh, not quite equally high, but, but slightly less, but still very high outside New England. That was a surprise to me, but there, I would assume it's because they consider Boston to be really a cool place, Providence to be a really cool place, Burlington to be a really cool place. Uh, so in some sense, we're in competition when we look at the rest of New England. I will tell you off the charts, the, the out-of-state school guidance counselors, 81% of them said, I would push your school more with that name. I don't know how to position your school in the New England market. And then we did have a, a increase from out-of-state uh, students and parents. There was, yes, I would take your school more seriously if it was. That was not as huge as I was expecting, but the fact that the guidance counselors in high schools across New England and Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and greater Boston said it would definitely drive traffic your way from my seat. Uh, made a huge difference. So I'm, I'm certainly going to lay this data out in much more detail, but I think we need to look at it. Why do it? One is you, we, we remember that 5% enrollment, 2% of it was dual enrollment increases, 2% of it was retention of the present students we have, only 1% of it, say this again, only 1% of it was new students. We are going to hit a ceiling hard and we're going to hit it fast and we're gonna end up in a difficult set of situations unless we're thinking differently. So it's gonna be painful a little bit to make those changes. I think, you know, Gorham needs to be reassured in this process and they will be by me. You can't have a great USM without a great Gorham. You just can't. You know, we can never replace it. There was a talk during the difficult times. Let's, uh, you know, let's get rid of the Gorham campus. And how could you possibly replace, just in athletics, probably $300 million worth of market value uh, commitments that we have in athletics out there, let alone our music program, et cetera? It's not feasible. There's an advantage for us with rural students to have them in Gorham first before they come in here. Gorham is a central part of it. I will say, and I love Gorham, I taught there at the high school for 13 years. I met my wife there and my grandmother went to the Gorham Normal School there. So I love Gorham. It doesn't buy us much on the out-of-state market. In fact, it buys us almost nothing. I'm sorry to say that. Portland buys us something, and it's huge. So I think we need to think about it. The other piece, the second reason, is that it unites us with the entire UMaine system, right? We're the only one that looks like a completely sort of regional school. We don't have the University of Maine anything in our title. And I think that there's a part of being back as we start to work together with the whole constellation. There's a power there. And third, we are constantly confused with the University of Southern Mississippi, uh, every school in greater Portland, Oregon, uh, the Southern Maine Community College. We need an identity that's clear. University of Maine at Portland gives us that strong identity. So I'm leaning, I'm gonna be honest, based on the data, I'm leaning to a solid yes, but I'm not gonna make that decision until I've gone out and talked to everybody. Uh, we're gonna try to go to the student senate, uh, the faculty senates, the classified senates, et cetera, and uh, so that we can make that decision and, and talk about why we're making that decision. So, so that's, that's kind of where we are. I think you've, we've just gotta think differently, and if the data says it will drive traffic our way, it definitely will, so, yeah, Bob. <laughs> well, I will say again, Lewiston has said to me several times, we don't consider ourselves Southern Maine anyway. And I think that there's some truth to that. Um, so I'm not sure that it matters. I mean, remember, in the long run, uh, you've got University of Maine at Augusta who has a place in Bangor. So we, I think what we need to do is we need to say, if we are going to be a different name, University of Maine at wherever, we need to say with campuses in Gorham, Lewiston, and Portland, just to be really clear so we, everybody sees, and online, as Nancy wants to remind me, and online, uh, we just need to be really clear that we have a universe, a constellation, or a, a set of, set of uh, 
campuses, multi-campus approach to, to education. So it will be tough. We haven't looked at the numbers. And by the way, this will be a multi-year process. So uh, we need to bring it to the legislature. We need to bring it to the BOT. Uh, and before we even do that, I want to have more internal discussions. So, so. I'm mindful that we've kept you well past the hour. I, I can stay for a few more minutes. If any of you have questions that you'd like to address with me or any of, uh, any of my folk, please come up. And for everyone else, thank you so much for your time this morning.